Hey, this is Jeff Shine. You may know me as the voice of Carlos Oliveira in Resident Evil 3, or as Captain America in the upcoming Marvel's Avengers. And you're listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. And listen, don't worry guys, I'm not going to go and leave you fans in a cold, cruel, Carlosless world. The Casanova Podcast, the number one podcast in Hawaii, is brought to you by these contributors on Patreon. If you'd like to see more content like this more often, as well as more podcasts, reviews, impressions, early access releases, live streams, and original content, then consider becoming a patron today. All right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikel Casanova, and I'm coming at you with another phenomenal interview. And in today's episode, we've got the honor and privilege of having the one, the only, Jeff Shine on the show. And Jeff Shine is the voice of Rizzy Evil 3 Remake's Carlos Oliveira, as well as Steve Rogers in the upcoming Marvel's Avengers by Square Enix. And it is just such an honor to have an illustrious actor and voice actor on the show such as Jeff. And we're going to talk about everything from his career, how he got started as a voice actor, as an actor, and so much more. So if you're ready to do it, I'm ready to do it. Let's go ahead and welcome Jeff onto the show. Welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I am your host, Mikhail Casanova, and I've got the honor and the privilege of having the one the only Jeff Shine, man. How's it going, man? It's it's an honor to have you on the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, things are going great, man. It's good to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, man. Thank you, thank you. And uh, dude, let's uh, do introductions. Tell people where they can find you on social media and any upcoming ventures. Uh, yeah. <laughs> sure. sure. Um, so my social media is actually nice and simple. Um, my Twitter is uh, is Twitter. Uh, yeah, at Jeff Shine. Um, my Instagram is, is uh, Jeff Shine, um, and uh, stuff I've got coming up. Um, I mean, you can check me out now on Resident Evil Three. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, that just came out. A um, couple other projects slated for. Well, I mean, I hope this year. I guess we're not really sure at this point exactly when. Um, but uh, Disintegration is another game coming out mm-hmm. um, pretty soon, and then uh, Marvel's Avengers uh, with Crystal Dynamics is coming out later on, hopefully this year. Mm-hmm. Um, those are a couple of things you can see coming up. Cool, cool. I'm actually, um, I'm actually working with uh, Marcus Leto to get him on my show to talk about disintegration. Yeah, a friend of mine. So it's it's really cool, man. Uh, okay. <laughs> Marcus and I started to connect um, after I after we had begun work on the project. But he's a mm-hmm. great dude, and I really enjoy talking to him. He's such a smart guy and with great vision and storytelling. Yeah. I feel really privileged to get to work with him. He's awesome. Awesome, man. Awesome. And, and then, you know, you're, you're Steve Rogers, Captain America and the upcoming Avengers. How does yeah. that feel, man? <laughs> um, it feels great. I mean, really, it, it's a great feeling and, and it's a, it's obviously an, an honor and a privilege to get a chance to do that. Um, I, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things when I think you, you, in the beginning, it feels a little surreal mm-hmm. and you can really feel like you really feel the weight of it you know, cause they're big shoes to fill. And obviously it's a character that people really care about and feel like a great affinity to. And, um, you know, you want to, you want to honor and respect, um, the history of the character and then figure out what your contribution to it is. Uh, but it, it's awesome. It's really like a, it's a really a dream come true. Yeah. Yeah. True. Man. I, I'm excited to, 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 to play the game. Actually, uh, I was working with uh, Square Enix last year at E3, uh, and I got to experience yeah. a lot of the stuff behind the scenes of, uh, you know, at, you know what they had at E3 show, well, both on and off the showroom floor. So it yeah. was it was pretty amazing what what you guys have been able to do so far with that. <laughs> you um, you may have even seen more than I have at this point. Possibly, possibly. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, we got we got to see some stuff like a little bit. Um, I saw more at Comic Con than mm-hmm. I did at three, um, but I've been really pleased with what I've seen so far. Cool, cool. I'm really, really pleased. I'm excited. 
and I'm, I'm really excited to for people to um, jump into the story. Yeah. I think we're telling a really cool, really original story. Isn't it amazing how like gaming has just progressed so far, like over the last 30 years from like little pixel characters to like 3D realistic models, like it's it's come so far. <laughs> well, and it's really, and it, yeah, I mean, it's really changed the way that you tell stories in a game, and it's really changed. I think the the effectiveness of the storytelling, and because of that, I think games are being seen and taken as as viable mediums to tell really you know um, complex, complicated, and heartfelt stories. You know that are that are character driven. I think in the beginning, games used to have to they had to be sort of technology driven or action driven and and it was the mechanics of the game that would sell it mm -hmm. um fun to play and now like the game almost can't be just fun to play it has to be engaging as well so yeah. you really you, know, you need to be firing on on all cylinders but i i love that games have become a vehicle to tell stories you know because it also it, it creates a world for you that's limitless you can do anything you want yeah true true and, and man, you, you mind giving like a, a brief background on yourself because you're not only a, a voice actor, but also an actor as well and a gamer. Yeah. Like, how, how was your how did your journey start? Um, yeah, so so I started. Um, I guess I really started when I was a kid, uh, but I was just, but I wasn't really, I was not one of one of the actors who sort of like knew, or or better put, took seriously acting as a child. I was doing it. I was in middle school and I was in plays, but it was more just because like that was what kind of everybody did at that particular middle school I grew up in. It was like cool to be in the play. Mm -hmm. So I was doing plays in middle school and then um, uh, I would, did a little community theater in high school, but it really wasn't until like, you know, my, my senior year, I think in high school that it dawned on me that this was something you could pursue as a profession, like that I could do as a career. Um, because it just wasn't part of the conversation growing mm -hmm. up. Um, so in high school, I sort of had that realization. And then from there, I, I kind of went full bore. And I went uh, I went to college and majored in, in theater uh, and minored in film and television. Um, and right from there, came out to Los Angeles and, and have been here for the last, you know, I don't know, 13 or 14 years since. Mm -hmm. um, so since then, it's been just, you know, all in. And that's the only thing I've really been focused on doing. Where are you originally from, if you don't mind? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm from Connecticut originally. I grew up uh, in a small town in Connecticut called Oxford. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Cool. I'm an East Coast guy. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, how was that transition, you know, going from, uh, you know, from Connecticut to Los Angeles? Like, was that a big cultural shock or? You know, I think it's, I mean, in some ways it was a cultural shock, but in other ways I felt like incredibly prepared for it because I, I wanted it so badly. I, mm -hmm. I you know, I, I loved the town I grew up in, but I, I was aware, I think, from a very young age that the town was, um, it, it, I remember feeling it very sort of like one note. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that there was just more and I wanted to experience more and, and try new things and meet different kinds of people. Um, and so by the time I was really ready to move to Los Angeles, um, I was ready for whatever that experience was um, and, and was really hopeful that I would be one with like a tremendous amount of diversity, different people, different ideas, different thoughts. Um, so I don't know that it was so much as a, a culture shock as it was, um, you know, um, a sort of a, a pleasure to dive into. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I can understand that. Like I, because uh, I'm originally from Western Samoa, and I went from Western oh, Samoa wow. when I was seven, and yeah. um, we went to Memphis, Tennessee. My dad, my dad's. Uh, my That's got to be a transition, dude. That was huge. <laughs> You're asking me about transition. That's like that's a whole universe. Dude, I yeah. Look, so going to Memphis, I had to, I because I was seven, I didn't speak English at all. <laughs> I had to learn English and then had to. Uh, uh, did your parents speak English? Yeah, well, yeah. So my mom's Samoan, Hawaiian, and Tongan, and my dad mm -hmm. is uh, he's uh, Italian, uh, black, and um, Creole, uh, Creole and Native American. So my dad was in wow. the Marine Corps. So when we uh, moved to Memphis, it was just because he had finally got stationed from being overseas, and yeah. so we, we, my mom wanted us to move there and be with him. And then when we got there, it just started like, you know, we started hopping, you know, the whole military brat life. And I was going to ask you if you moved around a lot. 
Yeah, it is like just adjusting to like different places, different things, and like coming from an island where you only spoke one language, you, you kind of all dress the same. And, you know, I basically grew up as an agriculture kid, and it's like I'm here in the city. I don't, you know, understand like nuances, you know, American nuances and stuff like that. So it was, yeah. it was a shock. And then at 15, uh, I left Hawaii. Oh, well, not Hawaii. I left Memphis. Or I think, no, we were in Memphis. We were somewhere else. I, can't, I, can't, I forget where. I'm just going to say Memphis for the time being because it's relative. But we mm-hmm. left the South, somewhere in the South, and came out here. I came out here to Hawaii. My mom was like, you're going to go to college. So she tested me out of uh, out of high school to go straight into college. And it was just, that, that so was what age, was, that? <laughs> uh, what age was that? I was uh, 15 when I tested out of high school and 16 when I went to college because my mom was like, super strict like Samoan culture man they're super strict when it comes to education like he's like no you're testing that you're going to school now and it's like it was even more of a culture shock because i got so used to like you know the east coast the south of america now i'm here (laughs) back in hawaii you know and it's so different and uh especially going to college man people are so different i was the youngest person in college and like there's so much i didn't understand and it's like I look back on it. I, I talk to my mom now, and I'm like, "Why did you do that?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, funny, it's funny you say that because I remember even thinking sometimes now. I think like even going to college at 18 or 19 or whatever age it was when I started it, my freshman year. I remember thinking like, I almost wish I went to college. Na- you know, now when you're more prepared, you're more yeah. you know sort of open to all these ideas. It's it's so much, and you're and you're younger than you realize at 18, 19. You know what I mean? Yes. It's almost yes. better to like you know take some time away. <laughs> Um, it, it's why, you know, I, I know it's become more prevalent, but I, I, I always think it's a great idea when, when parents and their, and their kids maybe decide collectively, you know, we're going to take a year off, maybe work or, or do something productive and then enter into like college, because there's a real opportunity to learn there. But sometimes I don't think you're, you're in the right headspace for it, mm-hmm. but just going back to what you're saying really quickly, when, when you're talking now, looking back, right at your yeah. age now, and looking at all the traveling you did, all the different places you lived and been, it's got to it's got to give you such a better perspective. Yeah. Compassion. And I, and they say like travel is the cure for like fear, you know? No, I agree. I agree. I, um, this is something like, um, Nick Apostolita is a uh, voice of, uh, Leon Kennedy. He's sure. one of my best friends and we talk all the time. Oh, really? Yeah. That's one of my best friends. He, he actually, uh, he, he called me up. Uh, he, he actually called me up yesterday when, um, my, my kid and I passed away. Cause I posted about yeah. it. He, he called me up. He's like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, and we do it all the time. We talk all the time. And, um, yeah, him cool. and I, him and I, we were talking about how, like, um, you know, we, we, how traveling has just like been such a, a, a blessing because sure. a lot of people, they don't, you know, a lot of people, especially I, I can speak to like people here in Hawaii, people in Samoa and even in Tonga, like a lot of people grow up in their area and don't travel their whole life, yeah. you know? And it's like, when you travel, you get to see so much, experience different cultures, you know. In, in my your 20s, perspective. I, yeah, your perspective changes dramatically. Like in, in my, um, I'm in my, my 30s now, but like when I was in my 20s, I did a lot of traveling when I left college. You know, I went to Washington State and, you know, I worked for Microsoft. I went to uh, New York. I went, you know, overseas to other countries and just seeing people all over the world you know, in, you know, in their towns, in their environments, just really helped me understand how things, you know, how things change, how people view and, and perceive things. And it's, yeah. it's something I tell a lot of people, like my nieces and nephews are like, oh, I'm going to go straight to college. Oh, I'm going to go and do this. And I'm like, take time. Because if I could, like, you know, if I could, now I feel like it's the best time. Because when you're, when you're 18, 17, 19, 20, you don't, understand things in the perspective that you would when you're in your later 20s or your 30s like how could, life so and how could you possibly right yeah. <laughs> you're limited, i mean you, there there is a limitation you're limited by age in a way right it's not your fault yeah. and you don't have to apologize for it, but you're limited you you have a limited experience right which yeah. is why it's 
thing like in American culture, we don't value el- you know the, our elders as much as other cultures do, and it's yeah. really a shame. I, I even think about it for myself now, thinking about like you know my aunt or, or sorry my uh, my uncles or my grandfathers or my grandmothers who have passed yeah. away. I'm thinking like man, at this age now, how much more I would have appreciated the experience they have the knowledge they have because yeah. it's like every at every age at every major milestone in your, in your life you think you know so much and then you get to the next one and you realize how little you knew and sometimes you don't even know what you don't know you know yeah. what i mean yeah yeah so and, so it's and i think if you're i think if you're at a young age if your funds limited just travel the United States. I mean, you don't yeah. have to even think as broad as like, I got to get overseas or like, if you're, if your funds restricted, if you don't have a lot of money, just travel around the U S because it doesn't, you don't have to go that far to find a very different cultural dynamic. If you're in mm-hmm. the East coast, go to the Midwest, go to the West coast. It's a very different, it's a very different mindset and yeah. having, having an understanding of other people's perspective will help give you for me, which has been one of the most important life lessons that I've learned, which is just compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's something that, you know, my wife and I, my wife is actually from uh, uh, Molokai, which is uh, one of the, I want to say it's like the smallest island out here in Hawaii. And it's oh, wow. uh, a lot of people, a lot of people never even heard of it, but it's very, I guess you could say like very country in a way, very, you know, not, not saying like backwater, but not, not modernized. Like they're not like For a sure. metropolis or something like that. And it's, uh, mm-hmm. you know, her perspective for mine, like we're both from, you know, like a, a agriculture country background. And so like a lot of things like we don't understand, like even now, um, you know, there's cer- certain things that she experiences here in Honolulu, uh, since this is kind of like the, I guess you could say like the LA of Hawaii, like she's, mm-hmm. she's experiencing that. And she's like, Oh, I don't fully understand why people do this or why people act this way. And a lot of people are like, Oh, but you're all, you know, you know, Hawaii is all the same. Like, no, each island is so dramatically different yeah. from one another. And, uh, you know, last year is the first time my wife and I uh, have actually had the opportunity to travel together because we've been married for four years now, uh, going on five. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, you know, we're both content creators. We both went to E3. We went to uh, various conventions last year. And you guys needed year, a we- convention on E3 or something? Huh? Like, did you guys, did you guys meet through like your love of like, you know, concept like E3 or Comic-Con or like conventions no. like that? No, no, no. We've actually, uh, my oh, wife and I, we've actually known each other for over a little over 10 years now. Uh, we met, it's kind of funny. We met at a club. Uh, I was a club promoter when I was uh, in my early twenties and she, she uh, would come out for college nights and I met her and I was like, oh, I'm going to try and see if I can talk to her. Cause I thought she was cute. And when I tried to approach her, she was unlike every other girl. Cause like I said, it's the whole country aspect. So she's talking about agriculture and I was like, wait, you, you know, agriculture. She's like, yeah, yeah, I do. So we started talking about farming and, and plant right. life and stuff like that in a club of all places. And we kind of just sure. clicked from there. And we have just been friends for 10 years. And then like, uh, we started dating four and a half, five years ago. And then, within the end of that year <laughs> we got married and yeah wow. um best best person that's ever happened to me <laughs> oh that's great man that's awesome <laughs> but yeah it's um but it's just kind of crazy like when we started dating um she was into video games and you know most, most you you know like most women i know <laughs> are not are not into gaming and it's is you know I I know it's like things have changed now where you have a lot of women that are playing games and streaming and stuff, but I'm like, yeah. it was it, coming up, it was really weird, to, not weird in a bad way, but weird in a shocking, surprising way to find, a, you know, a woman or a female that's into gaming. And like when I we reconnected five years ago, uh, and we hung out at her place, she was playing uh Super Ghouls and Ghosts on Super Nintendo, and I was like. Is that wow. yours or is that your 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 brother's or she's like no it's mine. Like, <laughs> the one thing if you walk in and you playing like the current system or something right. like, but you if you're playing something retro, you got to have that moment where you're like, please be real, please be real. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so she's playing that. And she's like, oh, I, I got all these other games too. And so she just pulled out her other stuff and she had like, you know, she had uh uh original. She had some Resident Evil games. She had 
Mega Man games, they had classic uh, Castlevania games and stuff like that. NES, like oh, she's got wow. like her whole collection she has over here and is part of what you can see over here. And it's like is that her is that her corner behind you? Yeah, yeah, she has her old setup <laughs> over here. Yeah. So it, it was That's just, cool. it was crazy. I was like, wait, but you're from Molokai. She's like, yeah, but I'm still a gamer. <laughs> so, so who's, who's more competitive? Her. I, That's I so say- funny. I like too. <laughs> well, and I'm a pretty competitive dude, but she's very competitive. Like we can't play anything without it getting very, very heightened, but it's like, it's such a great quality. It's so fun. Like, like, I, like, I'm not sure if your wife is the same way, but mine is like certain games. She'll not be good at it. But then when I'm like, Hey, do you want me to take over? She's like, no, damn it. I'm going to figure it out on my own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so my wife's not a gamer, although, uh, although I, I am lucky. And I almost think it's like, you, you sort of need this in, in your relationship, but she totally respects and is interested in and always like wants to participate, but she doesn't play herself, but she'll frequently be like, kind of watch you play this thing. Or if I, if I did, a, if I worked on something, she'll want to see. So, so that is like good enough for me, but where we get really competitive is like, she's big into like categories like mm-hmm. word games, but, but I mean, the woman is outstanding is amazing because she can turn anything into a competition. Yeah. So like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's great. That's great. Dude, like I, I ended up, um, so, you know, I got a review copy of Resident Evil 3 from Capcom and then uh, we picked up our collector's edition of it. And so, you know, her community on, cause she streams too. She does, you know, reviews and content and stuff like that. Yeah, just like, yeah. like I do. And then she was like, her, her community was like, hey, would you play Resident Evil 3? Because they've won- been wanting to see her play a horror game. She's like, oh, I don't know. You would like play it. Yeah, so she streamed yeah. it, and she was at first she was terrified, like she was having jump scares left and right, and then oh, she yeah. got to a point she's like, "Screw this!" and she started getting <laughs> better at headshots and, uh, you oh, know, right. dodging and like I was shocked because you know most people I would think you know, and that was her first Resident Evil she played by herself, so she was, you know, most people I would think would not want to hop into something like that. You know, because typically she plays action games, RPGs, and stuff like that. But she hopped into it, yeah. took to a fish to water, and um, actually beat it in two streams. And then she's like, "Okay, I need to play more." So then she went back and she started playing Resident Evil Two. And then we're gonna get her playing uh, uh, Resident Evil Remake, and then the entire oh, right. series. And she's like, "I love this. I need to know what happened." <laughs> That's dope. That's cool. I love that. But. It's crazy. Like I, I tell a lot of people, like it, it, you're truly, it's truly a blessing when you have a partner, especially if you're a gamer, that maybe they may not be a gamer, or if they, you know, they'll casually play, but they can respect that you have a passion for it and not be like, ah, put the controller down. <laughs> it's funny to me how games for a while fell into this category of like that thing that you, that became divisive, right? It's like mm-hmm. you would never have conversation about something like if your if your husband or if your wife was a painter yeah if they were painting in the studio for a couple hours you know what i mean and, and i know it's different or what or if they you know or if they were into rock collecting or whatever their hobby is but like you know i find and, and the stigma sort of of games where you're alone in a room by yourself anti-social and mm-hmm. you know it's so funny. just last night I, I was downstairs in my office and i was playing and, and my wife was upstairs watching tv and i came up and i just kind of like sat on the couch next to her and i was like you know what's like really cool you know, we're all in quarantine. It's it's a, it's a difficult time, and I'm down there, and I'm playing with these three guys that I've known, and after I did the math, for 18 years, mm-hmm. I started. I, you know, we met a couple times in person and stuff, and but you know, these are dudes that I just like met online 18 years ago. It's like highly social. A lot of times, it becomes like, especially now, I've never been yeah. more grateful for games or you know being able to play online because it's highly communal. It's sometimes like the only like you know hangout I get a chance to do. Yeah. It is. And it's like, that's the other thing too. Like I I was, um, I think I was talking to some folks in my, you know, that in my community here that are watching now. And I was saying like the older you get, like the less time you have to like hang out with people in real life. And yeah, if if you're playing online, like, you know, I'm I'm the same as you, man. There's some people I've been playing with online since the original Xbox and I'm still, still tight with them today. And it's like those, and a lot of them I've never even met. And I'm super close to it. And it's just crazy how, you know, as, as divisive as people try to make gaming, 
it's really brought a lot of us together. Absolutely. And again, like, you know, you think about a time like now, it's really a, it's really a great way to stay connected to people, you know, yeah. to, to feel like your, your little environment is not as small. Um, and so I'm, I'm super grateful to, to be able to play games, to get to be a part of their creation. Like, I don't know. I think it's a great, I think it's a great world and a great universe. And, and um, I think more people, I mean, you know, not that the community is small in any way, but I think more people would love it who who don't know as much about it. I think if they gave it a shot, they'd probably get into it because there's a game for everybody. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's it's um it is something because like my my mother, like a lot of people are shocked when I say, you know, my mom, my mom's like 69 years old. She games. Mm -hmm. You know, she's the one who got me hey. into RPGs because when I was growing up, you know, the only thing I would play is like you know, Street Fighter or Contra and all their stuff like that. And when she got the original PlayStation, I think, well, yeah, back in 97, she ended up getting me Mega Man X4 because she knew I was hyped about that. And then she got me uh, Final Fantasy VII. And I didn't want to play that because I was like, oh, mom, it's got too much reading because, you know, I was already coming over the adjusting to English and adjusting to sure. American life. And she's like, you know, you, you would like it. And so I ended up getting into it it helped me with reading it helped me with understanding english better it it helped open me into you know getting into fantasy and expanding my imagination and you know that was one of the things like i, I did an interview last week with uh one of the voices of barrett uh from the remake that just came out and i was telling him like how that game helped me out so much and and uh, also with Chris, uh, cody christian who's the voice of cloud i was like man like that game is so special to me because it really helped me when I was in that transitioning phase, you know, yeah. you know, from, a, well, when I say transitioning, I mean, put emphasis people, you know, <laughs> from, yeah. from, from another country to, to American life. And it yeah. really, it really helped me. And it's like, when I see, you know, you see media like saying games are this and they're that. And I'm like, have you ever played a game? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can polarize anything if you take it to its extreme, but at the yeah. heart of all these things, you know, especially at the heart of games, you're really just talking about storytelling and, yeah. um, and you know, and they do become these really important milestones in people's lives. I mean, for me, you know, I think everyone has like, you know, the, the song you remember at this one particular time, this movie you remember, right? Or like a clothing and then, and, but also like for me, there's what game was I playing at that time? What was super important? Certain games stand out. Street Fighter mm -hmm. was the big one for me. I remember as a kid, my best friend's father was a, he was playing Zelda and the, the idea like an adult was playing a game. I remember mm -hmm. he finally, it. His wife bought him like a little trophy with Link on it. And I was like, this is the coolest shit I've ever seen. Like, you know, games are milestones, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's just crazy. Like a lot of the people, you know, I've gotten the opportunity over the last couple of years to like works, you know, with the games industry. Like when Capcom yeah. comes out here, you know, the, the various projects that they've worked on from Resident Evil 3 to Devil May Cry 5 and more. And you know, being able to work with the ja the Capcom Japan team when they come yeah. here, when they go other places, like, you know, seeing what the sound team does, seeing what the motion capture team does, seeing what the, the voice acting cast does, like, there's so much that goes into the creation of games now that, you know, when I see people make comments like, oh, you know, this is lazy, they didn't put in effort, I'm like, you have no understanding of how much goes into this. <laughs> I remember it was, a, it was a great example. It's just that totally like the echo you said. I remember like talking to a, one of the tech guys and, and being like, you know, I forget what game we were talking about, but you can apply it to anything. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We were talking about it was like an FPS game. And, you know, he was like, you know, what you don't know is every time a bullet is fired from a gun and hits a surface, someone has to go in and hand draw what caliber round it was. Like every bullet impact. Mm -hmm drawn differently what was the caliber what surface is it hitting was it at an angle was it straight on so it's like there is so much detail being done and and you know there in much like in in films you know you really only get into this stuff and maybe this is just my feeling because you love it like you yeah. have to love it you gotta love games if you're hand drawing every you know every projectile impact like mm -hmm. so these are of love and I understand I get it like as a gamer too sometimes I'm playing something and I'm like come on 
when did they do that? Like that just seems, <laughs> then you have to like remember like, yeah, but there's a thousand reasons why maybe not. And I'm sure that's the, I'm sure there's a guy on that team doing, saying the same thing. Like, I wish we had gotten to that thing. I wish we could have done that. But at some point, right, you, at some point you have to take this thing you work on. You have to package it up, slap a price tag on it and send it out. The same thing with film. We didn't run into the same thing when we're shooting movies or, or TV. Like you, if you could, you take you do a 900 takes of everything and make sure it was perfect but you know yeah and it is it's just you know like getting to see you know even like with 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 movies you know a lot of movies are shot out here in hawaii and i've had you know yeah. the pleasure to be able to help out with many of the crews and and meet a lot of the people that are out here well, oh, they yeah. come out here to do like you know Hawaii Five O or or do like the Rock's recent movie Hobbs and Shaw. Oh, like, Shaw yeah, you know it's like getting to to meet them and and to to work with them on their projects and just seeing how much goes behind the scenes, how much goes into the final product, and it's just it it really it, it's like case in point. It's like what we were talking about earlier about traveling. You get a greater appreciation for for what really goes into the making of stuff and it's just it's absolutely insane <laughs> i think i think if you're somebody i think curiosity and um curiosity and awareness and the ability to like and the ability and the interest to learn is, is really what like bridges the gap on a lot of things right it's it, yeah. the more you know about a subject the more you know about people the more you know the more compassion you have, the more understanding you have, the more connected you feel. So it's like, and then, and then once all that starts to shift, you can have a much greater appreciation for anything. That's why I like, that's why I love, you know, documentaries so much about anything. I'll watch a documentary about fucking anything mm -hmm. just because like, once you go, once you deep dive into something, it becomes interesting. I mean, I watched a documentary on glass blowing, which, you know, I, I, you, you, I didn't know anything about. And then you start to see all of the intricacy and like anything can become not only interesting, but inspiring. Mm hmm. Yeah. Speaking of uh, your love of documentaries, what are some things that you enjoy, man? Like, what are your, some of your hobbies and interests? And I know, like, with this interview, yeah. we are, and for those who are watching, we are going to get into Resident Evil 3 and <laughs> 4. But y'all know when you come to the show, I, the focus is my guests and them as a person. So I get, I got to ask, man, what, what are some of your hobbies? What are some of the things that you absolutely love? Like, yeah. take us down that walk. <laughs> Um, where to begin? I mean, you know, so I'm, I'm really into, um, I'm really into fitness and, and mm -hmm. physicality and movement. Um, I spend a lot of time like learning uh, different disciplines and things like that. Right now I'm, I'm, I'm um, participating in, in a uh, tack fit, which is a system developed by a guy named Scott Sonnen. Um, and I won't like deep dive into it too much, but it's, it's, it's a really smart and intelligent system and a, a great way to like stay in shape and gain more mobility in your body. I just recently started rolling jujitsu and training a little Muay Thai, um, which I, I really like. I've always just been really interested and fascinated in like the connection to one's body, which has also helped me a lot in my work, mm -hmm. um, just being able to move understanding movement and i'm always thinking about like man when i'm old i want to be able to, to move i want to be able to function do things i don't want to be stuck because i can't pick up my groceries or i you know so um i'm really into like fitness and in those aspects um i'm a film fanatic i love movies it's my happy place um if you know if my wife and i can go together but even sometimes i'll go to, I'll go to the movies by myself i love it um what else i'm, I'm a huge i'm big into music um what am I listening to now? I'm listening to um, a lot of Bon Iver right now, uh, The War on Drugs, mm -hmm. uh, Churches. Um, what else? I'm big into my dog. We're like, we're like dog fanatics over here. My wife and I both. Um, she does a lot of work with like uh, charities with animals and um, we've adopted, we have two dogs ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, what else am I doing? I'm a huge gamer. I mean, actually, and this is beyond just like, um, doing work in games. I've been a gamer my whole life. Mm -hmm. um, I even took a, a brief step at, at trying to play professionally when I was much younger. Um, played some tournaments, won a few. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of what I'm into. That, that tournament life is, uh, is real serious. Like, I, I don't think people understand, like, if you want to go and be like a professional, you know, video game player, whether it's Call of Duty or Battlefield or Fortnite or Street Fighter, you got to yeah. eat, sleep and live that life. 
It's a whole, <laughs> it's like, I mean, look, I think, you know, it's a great example. And it's it, right. It seems odd when we talk about like, in terms of games and having to be that dedicated to, to be good at playing a game. However, it's the same, it's the same thing. You have to be that dedicated to be great at anything. Yeah. Like if you want to be great, if you really want to be great, you know, there's always, there's that old adage of like the 10,000 hours. Right. But in a lot of ways, that's true. Like if you want to be great at something, you have to put the time in and, and being a professional gamer is no different. You got to be on the sticks all day long yeah. and like in the hours and it's a vibe look and it's a viable profession at this point like we're it, what a cool time that if you want to play games for a living put the work in yeah yeah uh i i know um with, with what you're saying about fitness dude i'm, I'm huge into fitness myself uh yeah. i um a little bit about me I, i've shared this before but you know i'm, I'm four years in remission from cancer so I got one more year and I'm completely cancer free. And I, when I, before I, before I, before I had a uh, colorectal cancer, uh, which is, it, it seems to run in my family because uh, my dad is battling it again right now. And my, oh, one of my older brothers went through it. And um, what had, what, what happened with it was um, it, you know, when I started going through, I went from being, you know, skinny in shape, you know, cut to, going through the chemo radiation and stuff like that, it really bloated me and like my body, like I gained a lot of weight. And since- Like, like a systemic inflammation kind of response? Yeah, yeah. And so I've been, you know, over the last uh, year and a half since I've gotten more stable with my health, I've been, you know, hitting the gym, doing cardio, hitting the bags, uh, lifting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was doing jujitsu at a point, jujitsu, jeet kundu. Um, I was doing Muay Thai and then trying to do, uh, what else did I do? Taekwondo, because we have a Taekwondo uh, school right down the street from where I live. You're in the pursuit of trying to get access back. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like, you know, that, that, that system you were talking about earlier, that fitness system, like I'm very curious about that because, you know, it's, it's especially hard. Like a lot of people think it's easy you know, during this current lockdown to just, oh yeah, just work out at home. There's a completely different mindset. It's a mindset thing. And I'll tell you again, I don't think people talk about it enough, right? Because it's easy. Like, look, with, with like Instagram and social media and stuff, everybody's displaying their best moments, right? And I get yeah. that. But like, you know, before, you know, r right before quarantine, I was, um, I mean, I was on it. It was consistent. Yeah. The diet was perfect. I was at the gym every day. And then, and I thought once I found out we were going to be in lockdown, I'm like, it'll be okay. I'll just roll this right into. And there was a chunk of time where I just, I couldn't make it happen. And the mindset was different and, and, mm -hmm. you know, such a mental game, but it's one of the things that I love about the gym and fitness in general is it demands of you mm -hmm. and you can learn a lot about yourself. I think you can really learn a lot about yourself in those moments because, you know, even for those of us, and I would say that you and I who enjoy working out and who appreciate like, you know, or have had times in their life when they haven't had access to their body or their health, you know, so there's that, that and you have a level of appreciation of that. I would imagine that I don't mm -hmm. have, but it can still be hard to find the motivation. And there are probably some days that you work out in spite of how you feel. Like, I don't feel like doing this. I don't really want to go down and hit the bag or I don't want to drill it out for a minute or, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't want to do leg day, yeah. but I hate it's got to get done. <laughs> but it's like, right. But, but it's always like, but you always, I try it's, I, and I don't always succeed at this. And I think it's important that people like, like hear other people saying like, sometimes I fail at this miserably. Mm -hmm. Like, you 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 don't always have the motivation, and um, and sometimes it's really hard to get it together to do that. Yeah, it is, it is, and you know it's it, the days when you just really don't like. There's nothing in you that makes you want to go and work out, and you're like, I gotta go. It's like, because if you don't go, you're going to beat yourself up about it later. And it's, it's well, and also when, you, when you've gone through not having access, this is what I was trying, this is what I remember I was trying to say before. When you go through not having access to something, mm -hmm. those days you don't want to go, and it's only because you just don't feel like it, you remember how bad you missed it when the choice wasn't yours. Yeah. Right. When you're, when you're on the couch because you have to be. 
you're like, God, I really want to go to the gym. And other days you're like just tired. You don't really feel like it. It's a lazy day. And you're like, ah, you know what I mean? If you, mm-hmm. I always try to remember the days when I wished I could have gone and I couldn't. And so yeah. I dragged my ass down and do it. Yeah. So, uh, oh, so for right now, like, um, the workouts you're doing. So you, you said that system, like, if you if you don't mind like talking a little bit about that system that workout system you're yeah. talking about yeah like so it's called TechFit. um okay. like i said scott sonnen is the guy who who invented it um mm-hmm. or created it um it is um it's a system that focuses a lot on like this sort of mind body connection um mm-hmm. we use all the club bells some kettlebell work um uh, a lot of body weight movement uh, mm-hmm. and, and couple very specific sort of time schemes, like 30 on, 30 off, a little bit of Tabata sometimes. Um, the workouts are usually shorter. They're mm-hmm. focused a lot on like being able to control breath during the movement. So they're, in a, they're, they're focused on efficiency of movement. It was developed originally, and if I misquote any of this, I hope somebody corrects me, but it was okay. developed originally to help um, uh, military uh, first responders and people like with sort of with sort of a job that's very demanding in that way to be able to like efficiently move um, and be able to have better work output without being as tired. So they found that like if you can control breath better, then your output of work can increase um, without necessarily having to be uh, stronger or fitter. Right? It's just that we have a lot of efficiency and breathing. So there's a lot of focus on breath work. There's a lot of focus on like the mental side of it. Um, and then just like the access to and mobility through like all of your joints and, and, and being able to access the chain of muscles individually. Um, it's a, it's a dope system. I also think like it also gets you introduced into like club bells, which Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you you got a chance to like play around with those at all, but they're a great way to like sort of switch up your fitness routine and they give you a, a whole different experience with, you know, 25 pounds on a club bell feels a lot different than 25 pounds on a dumbbell. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I definitely, I'm, I'm definitely going to look into that because some of the things like I've, I've done to, ooh, ooh, ooh. some of the things like I, I've done to, to mix it up. Cause you know, some days I'll do I, at least, well, before the lockdown, at least two times a week, I would do like heavy lifting, you know, just for yeah. strength. And other than that, I would do cardio and, and, you know, bags and rolling, you know, rolling mm-hmm. around, and uh, I know when Ruben uh, Langdon, you know, the guy who does uh, uh, Ken Masters and, and Dante, he's another one of my best friends. You know, he comes out here to Hawaii. He stays in my house. And some of the workouts he was showing me with bands, I'm like, really? You know, like body weight and all that? We could do. And jam. I, I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He's like, I just, he, he carries this, this thing around and he wraps it around a pole or a tree or whatever and does his whole yeah. workout. And I'm like, What? <laughs> yeah, I'm a huge proponent of bands, the variable resistance, and yeah. t- and then also under tension. Yeah, I so like yeah. As you're telling me this, I'm like I need to deep dive into something else. <laughs> yeah, and it's good to switch it up, like you know, to change to just change up the way those things hit your body. I think you know, I think change um, and keeping your body guessing is is super valuable. Definitely, definitely. All right. Um. So, okay. So. Getting into to, to acting, into voice acting, what were the first roles that you've had in both being an actor and a voice actor? Sure. Um, with with my on camera career, I think um, some of the first roles and actually and some of the like some of my favorites were when I was in college, I teamed up with this uh, group of guys um, at the time. They were called Ragtag Productions and they were just a group of college students who were just there was a writer and a director and they um and a camera op, and and uh, I was lucky enough to I, I auditioned for their first attempt at a feature film. Um, mm-hmm. They ended up casting me in it, and we ended up doing maybe I don't know ten or twelve projects over the course of of college. Um, we just worked a lot together, so that was really where I sort of like got my feet wet, being in front of the camera on a consistent basis. Um, and then after that, I, you know, I did a little work on um, the Guiding Light when I was a little younger, mm-hmm. and then. Um, eventually made it to, to TV and um, and then for games, I think my first job as, as a voice actor was actually a commercial. Mm-hmm. Um, but my first game was uh, was Call of Duty um, Advanced Warfare. Um, awesome. Yes. And then and then I think the one and then the, and then the first role that 
sort of, I think, became more, you know, noticed was uh, when I did Javi from The Walking Dead on season three for Telltale. Uh, nice. But those were kind of the early projects for me. Nice, nice. And and of all the voice work that you've done, like, is there a favorite, uh, not only voice work, but acting that you've done, is there any particular projects that have been your favorites or ones that just stood out for you that, you know, if you if you could do it again, and like, you, you would totally jump on it? Yeah, I feel really lucky. I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to pick a favorite in the context of like, what's the, you know, what is my absolute favorite? Because I, I really feel lucky, and I'm not just saying this, that all of the projects have have come at points in my life where they've they sort of left a mark in some way or another. You know, mm-hmm. I'll always have a special affinity, you know, to The Walking Dead because that really, for me, was kind of like the first that felt like mine, and it was it, it was gotten it was noticed a little bit more. And um, you know, Call of Duty is going to be special because it was the first one I ever did. It was my first time mo capping, first time doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, then I get to jump into Resident Evil and the cap is coming up. And, I, you know, that is just like iconic and amazing. And the people I get to work with and the other actors. So you know, I don't know. It's hard to pick a favorite, but they're all there because they're all special in a different way for a different reason at, at a particular time in my life. Um, and I feel really lucky because I've, I've always had genuinely good experiences. They, they, I, I like any one of those sets or those casts or those people I would revisit in a second if I could. Nice, nice. Um, so, so you know, how did it feel when you, you know, you you found out that you landed the role of the iconic Carlos Oliveira for Resident Evil Three? Like, was that a surreal moment for you, or? Yeah, it was. Um, it was cool, you know, because you're aware of how big the universe is. You know, Resident Evil is for me as a gamer, and then even if I wasn't a gamer, there's so many films and and so much like lore and history into that universe that it's hard to um, to not feel the weight of that and be aware of it. Um, and I was like really excited to get a chance to be a part of it. I actually felt thankful at the time because I didn't really know the original Resident Evil three at all. Um, I hadn't played that game. I think the first one I played was Resident Evil 2. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was nice. It was sort of nice to not have anything, any frame of reference, because I felt really free to just kind of do my own thing and take it in the direction that I wanted to take it in. Um, and I think that was kind of what the team wanted to do as well. Um, but I felt really you know, privileged, really excited to get, to get a chance to jump in. And I didn't know at the time. Like when I was auditioning, I didn't know um, what the project was going to be. Okay. Okay. Cool. And and it's something like I've, you know, with a lot of my friends that are voice actors, you know, they, they tell me this all the time. Like, you know, they'll go in and do two or three auditions for something and not even know until either it, sometimes it can be as soon as they get the script or sometimes it can be like, well, like several scripts in like, Oh, this is what I'm working on. You know? And it's like, a lot of people think that, oh yeah, you know, as soon as you get the role that, you know, this is what you're working on. It's like, no, that's not. (laughs) No, especially in games. I mean, especially in games and it doesn't even really matter the size of the project for the most part, although the bigger the project for sure, but no, especially in games, you do not know what you're working on. I mean, at least when you're auditioning, if you're a gamer, you have a little bit of it because sometimes you can pick up little like uh, hints that get left in the script about what the project might be. Mm-hmm. But uh, frequently, you might not know till you till the day you get on set. Yeah. Um. So, let's see, one of the questions that we got. Uh, so, what has been your experience voicing Carlos Oliveira in Resident Evil Three, and how has the fan reaction been to your performance in the role? Mm-hmm. Um, the experience is great. I mean, I loved it. We, we got to have a lot of fun with the character. Um, the director and I, I think had a great relationship and, and working relationship. And so we were able to really kind of in a way that felt very organic and fun. And, uh, you know, and we also were lucky enough to have a script that was awesome. The writers did a great job going in. So, you know, it wasn't like, you know, we had a great bones right from the get go. Um, mm-hmm. So the experience was fantastic. I, I love doing it. Would would happily do it again. Um, and the fans are awesome. They're like it's a really they're a really passionate and dedicated group of people. I, I mean, I, I feel really you know happy and and privileged that the reception has been great. I mean, people seem to really 
I have enjoyed the direction the character's gone in and, and kind of like how he occurs in the game now. Um, mm. And I feel really, I feel really grateful for their support. Um, welcome. I get like, uh, you know, I'm getting like messages on Instagram and, and you know, it, it feels nice to have people appreciate or enjoy what you do, especially when it's something that you, that you enjoy so much. Definitely, definitely. And and were you familiar with his previous portrayal? Uh, and did you just did they give you creative freedom to like add more of you know yourself into the character, or was there like any guidelines or anything like that? No, I mean, there was oh, the only I mean, the only guidelines really is sort of like how they envisioned the character initially. But I think what ends up happening, and this is sort of on every project, there's always everyone everyone always has an idea of what of what the character will be really are asking you to come in and contribute the missing piece of it. Right. It's like, we can write down on paper. He's uh, he's gregarious. He's fun. He's got a real serious side. He can be a bit of a dick or he, you know, Mm -hmm. and those are all great adjectives to describe somebody. But at the end of the day, like a personality has to flesh those things out. Right. Cause I could describe 11 different people with the same six adjectives and they all occur very differently. Yeah. Um, And so, (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think what you're actually being asked to do as an actor is to make a contribution. So, like, to make a choice, make a contribution, and it's, it's very frequently it's your own it's your own personal vision. And then that either jives with the direction of the project or it doesn't, and you get hired or not based on that. So, um, so yeah, certainly I felt like I was able to contribute, you know, my take on Carlos in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was very much, I think, in line and then maybe also uh, highlighted or nudged, uh, you know, the writing and the director in a, in a certain direction. But it's very collaborative. You know, it's got to start on the page. The director's got to have an idea of where it's going, and then your vision, you know, syncs up with all that, or it doesn't. Yeah. Um, do you mind? Because I know you did the motion capture as well. But do you yeah. mind giving the audience like a breakdown of the motion capture aspect for Resident Evil Three and what sure. it's what it's about and what it's like? Sure. Yeah. So I did. Um. So <clears throat> this this particular motion capture was done in two parts, or it's mm-hmm. two parts simultaneously. But it's called motion capture and then performance capture. So motion mm-hmm. capture refers to anything you know from the neck down, well, head down. But mm-hmm. performance capture is facial movement. So the system is uh, you're basically wearing a large unitard made out of um, like a Velcro sort of material. You have a lot of uh, light reflecting balls positioned at different points of the body on most of the major joints. Um. You also wear uh, an HMC, so a head-mounted mm-hmm. camera, a helmet with a camera, either one or two, that comes off the front uh, with a bunch of LEDs to light your face. Your face is also dotted at key muscle positions like your eyes and your mouth and your nose and cheeks, forehead. Um, and so once you're all, that's the, the sort of practical aspects of it. You're on, a, you're on a stage, which is called the volume, and that mm-hmm. stage is usually empty, save for like some... Um, blocked out maybe objects in the world. So let's say for uh, one scene, we're, we're working around uh, like a large tank. That mm-hmm. tank might be represented by, you know, scaffolding or rigging or large boxes. Um, there's hundreds of cameras surrounding you. Um, and then the scene begins and you go. And mocap has to happen in one take. So it's very much like theater in that way. There's no cutting in between. Mm-hmm. You have to, you know, beginning of the scene to the end of the scene, you have to run it all the way through. Um, and, and, you know, once that begins, if you've ever seen the behind the scenes of any making of any film ever, mocap is no different. You sort of, after all of that, you have to forget about the hundreds of cameras. You have to forget about the two in front of you and forget that you're wearing this ridiculous uniform. And then you have to play the scene and, 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 you know, and do the work. Um, in that way, it can challenge the imagination a lot. But if you've loved any, you know, any comic book movies in the last five years, at least one, if not more, scenes in that movie has probably also been mocap. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, got a question. Uh, my wife actually asked the question. Uh, hey, Lehula Superfina asked, uh, "How long did it take you to think of a personality for Carlos?" Um, it it doesn't. T- it didn't take too long, and like I said, because some of that was like on the page, and so you kind of get like you get a feel. I mean, a lot of it is just, it becomes, and this is like you work on your craft for a long time and, and for really forever. But hopefully, what that does is it heightens your instincts, so that you have like sort of an instinctual response to stuff. And um, so it wasn't about taking a long time to decide; it was just about 
making decisions. And it was like, you know, I, I, I really felt like you could see that he had this side of him um, that was a little bit lighter, capable, mm -hmm. but like a little bit lighter, kind of like funny, almost like cheesy in a way sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of times I think what you're doing is you're, you're like, you're playing with volumes of yourself. So it's the characteristics that I like, like sort of already have. And then you're mm -hmm. just like, I'm turning sarcasm a little bit. Maybe I'm turning down this and turning up that. And, and, and that's really, you know, kind of what it's like, but, um, how long did it take? I mean, not, not very long. I, I sort of think you got to be most of the way there by the time you're ready to go audition. And then when you get on set, those things shift a little bit, but you kind of got to come ready to play. Okay. Cause they don't know, right. They can't bank on you. Like you can't go to the audition with no clue. Yeah. And then have them go, well, I'm sure he'll be fine after we hire him and we start. It's like, <laughs> they need you to have already made a choice. I just got a text from, uh, Nick Apostolides. He said, Hey Jeff, Mikael, how y'all doing? Watching the show and loving it and enjoying it. <laughs> That's up, buddy. So, um, so Spirit Shock had a question. He wanted to ask, uh, as a gamer, what's your unbiased opinion on the backlash of Resident Evil 3's length? There's been Resident a lot, Re like the length of Resident Evil 3 remake. Uh, oh. There's been a lot of, um, I'll tell you this, from, as someone who, you know, reviews games and works with different outlets and other creators, there has been a lot of review bombing going on with a lot of AAA games that have come out from Doom Eternal to Resident Evil 3 Remake to uh, recent Final Fantasy 7 Remake. And it's it's been a consistent thing. Like, it's kind of like, it's popular, so I'm going to trash it, you know? You know yeah. But, uh... I mean, speaking to that as a generality, I think it's always easier and, and sometimes can feel um, it's easier to tear something down than it is to build it up. Yeah. I understand like everyone's got opinions and I think everyone should. And I think I think criticism is important because criticism pushes people to do better, to, mm -hmm. to um, evaluate their own work and always try to improve. I know. I, I think. I think he's speaking to like sometimes people have said the game has felt short. Yeah, they're they're saying it's super short. But what's funny is the the original, any of the classic Resident Evil games have never been very long. Yeah, so this is like, I don't. Sometimes I think sometimes that feeling of like you know it's funny and I've, I've said this before. I think in some ways, and I, and I and I understand what he's saying. I think in some ways though, if as an audience member, you're left feeling like you wanted more. Because I've frequently, I've walked out of I've walked out of like three hour films and been like that's it it's over already yeah I think sometimes like that's kind of a good place to leave um, and and maybe you've actually struck a really good note as a storyteller if at the end of your story people are like give me more like what the fuck that you know what yeah. I mean I think that's a great place to be to feel that little bit of like unsatisfied feeling you know mm -hmm. so. I get it, dude. I get it. We all, I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Those are decisions that happen way above my pay grade. Hey, I, I personally enjoyed it. And I got called out by people saying, oh, you're shilling for Capcom because they like you. I'm like, oh, um, man. <laughs> right. I think sometimes it's, I mean, it's really hard nowadays. It's like sometimes you're, it's like you, sometimes your opinion is just your opinion and yeah. it's not trying to like sell this or show for that or hate on this or hate on that it's like and it doesn't have to be more than that like i'm not like i'm not loving it so hard that you like to try to sell it to you but i'm also not hating it so bad to try to destroy it it's just it's not for me or it is for me and that's okay yeah. make your own enjoy it or don't and it's totally fine but people like everyone's very like we're all very sensitive about people's opinions now and it's like opinions oh, yeah. are great man Everyone has one. Have one. It's okay. But you don't have to cram it down everybody's throat or make that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it is, especially now, like I, I've been getting, so a lot of the negative feedback I get when I review something, you know, I see either I'm a show or I'm selling out or I'm just promoting sure. this or I'm, I'm paid. Apparently I'm paid by companies to, to review games, even though I can't legally do that. Uh, yeah. You're like, I wish I was. I'd love a check. Right. <laughs> like, I, Pay a bill, please. <laughs> so, yeah, right. Um, 
you, you know, the feedback I get is that I'm too positive. Like they want me to be more negative and critical. I'm like, I have a whole aspect of my review process where I am critical. Like, hey, there's a whole section where it's like, this wasn't great. This could have been improved. This wasn't at all good, but I see where they were trying to go. But I'm not going to just come out the gate and bash something because first impressions are oftentimes lasting ones. You know, and as a as a journalist and as a reviewer, I, I I feel it's my responsibility not only to the audience who are expecting a quality review, but for the companies that send me stuff. Like everything on this wall has been sent to me by some type of review, like some company, Microsoft, Sony, Nintendo, Capcom, whatever. And that business relationship between me and them is okay, you give it to me. I'm going to give you the best review that I possibly can generate. I'm going to cover everything that I can. People think that, oh, you just playing a game for fun and you get a code or you, they send it to you. I'm like, no, I objectively play it yeah. to, to find what's good, what's bad. That's why like when I stream it later, I'm like, I always say, oh, I finally get to enjoy it. <laughs> or I get that. I totally and, get that. And, and people don't get it. They they think like, oh, you know, you, you're just saying it's good. I'm like, no, because back in the day, like for you and I, back in the day, it was magazines or personally playing the game for yourself or yeah. word of mouth. We didn't have a, a Metacritic score where people are like, oh yeah, Metacritic says it's trash, so I'm not going to play it. Or this person says it's not good, so I'm not going to play it. Like, no, we, we literally had to play games by word of mouth because the internet was not what it was today so yeah and even still like look there have been frequently things that like you know i'll see a you know the rotten tomato score is low or the metacritic score is low or but it's like that for me is always a, it's a guidepost it's not mm -hmm. a definitive you know what i mean like i might love something and it's okay to love something everybody hates or it's okay to hate something everybody loves yeah all right <laughs> so it's like like it's it's not that serious. Like take a breather. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's not it's it's not that serious. So um, we got to uh, you know being respectful of your time, man. We're gonna wind down to the last couple questions that we got, but we got some audience questions too. We uh, Rogue Dragon 05 says, "Did you think Jeff of the personal space line, or was that in the was that in the script?" The personal space line. Uh, I think there was a situation. Oh, yeah. yeah. Personal space. Um, no, no, no. That was in the that was in the script. That was oh. in the script. Dude, your delivery of that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, you know, I really do have to say, I, I think when, when things are really working well and, and and firing well, you know, like I said, the script was was fantastic when we got it. The writers clearly like had an idea and a vision, and and that was great. And I was able to, uh, and it lined up with sort of mine as well. And then you know, as we were on set things would organically sort of like mold. So some lines would tweak a little bit or there was a I did have like a little bit of freedom if I wanted to like massage something in one way or the other, but um, it was really easy to respect the, the writing because the writing was there. Okay. Uh, Fangirl98 says, uh, uh, Carlos really surprised me in this remake how much airtime he has. And that was to me some of the best parts in the game and Jeff's performance was fantastic. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thanks a lot. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Ooh, um, let's see. Uh, Kennedy Ramirez asks, uh, are there any podcasts that you listen to? Yeah. Um, I like, uh, I mean, I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan. I listen to his podcast all the time. Um, I listen to, um, uh, what else do I listen to that I like a lot? I'm blanking on his name right now, which is super embarrassing. Um, uh, it's fine. <laughs> I do. Yeah, I mean, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan is usually my go-to. I listen to Joe Rogan a lot. Okay. Um, let's see. I, this is kind of a funny one, but Huey. That was it. Dak Shepard. <laughs> Huey wow. L. I couldn't pull that out if I was if I was paid at that point. <laughs> um. Let's see. Uh. Freezy says uh, they missed a lot of the earlier part of the stream of this interview, but uh, Jeff, did you play the game and have you seen some of the mods for this game? Uh, so I haven't had a chance to play it myself yet, but I have watched a lot of the like, playthroughs and, and um, I was also, when the game first came out, 
I was kind of popping into some of the live streams to just say what's up to the community and say hi. So I got to, I got to check out some of those. The only mod I've seen a little bit of is the and maybe I'm saying it wrong, but is it like the um, is it the facial expressions at 500? Mm -hmm. It's hysterical. <laughs> it's hysterical. Uh, Rogue Dragon asked, uh, "Did you ever try to incorporate Carlos's accent from the original? It was terrible." <laughs> yeah, not that accent. we did play with an accent for a second uh, as an idea, but I think we all just agreed sort of unanimously that it felt much more organic to just play it in my regular voice. Um, and I sort of and I felt good about that choice, you know. Mm -hmm. OK, OK. Um, let's see. So. Um, Oh, Candy Ramirez is another question. If there's time, is Jeff a fan of Star Wars? I like Star Wars. I'm a huge, yeah, I'm a fan for sure. Are you asking me like, am I Star Trek or Star Wars? Like, is it that or just general? Because I know that's like always a question. I like Star Wars. I think Star Wars is great. The original films are like some of my favorites. Obviously, they're like, I mean, they were huge when I was growing up. You know, my uncle was a massive Star Wars fan. So, um, yeah, Star Wars is you know, outstanding. I think I, I think it was general. I think you didn't. Let's go with general. Yeah. All right. So um, let's see. So with the uh, can, can you walk us through like what's the process of becoming like an actor and a voice actor, or more so like a voice actor? Like what advice or guidance would you give to the viewers and listeners of this uh, podcast that are interested in getting into the industry? Um. That's a huge conversation. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a loaded question. It's sort of like, it's sort of tantamount to like, um, I want to be a professional painter. I want to be a professional. I want to be a doctor. I want to be, and only in so much as, you know, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. So let me make, let me make it, I'll break it down practically. Um, if you're interested to, if you're interested in getting into it, the first thing I would ask is like, are you really? Meaning like, do you love it? Is it really something you want to do? Because, because you, you have to love it in order it, to really be successful at it, I think, because it is challenging and it, and it, it requires like sacrifice and mm -hmm. um, bravery in a lot of way. And I'm not elevating it above any other profession, period. Because I think to be good at whatever you do requires the same thing. If you want to be the best anesthesiologist, if you want to be the best carpenter, if you want to be whatever it is you want to do, it's going to take a tremendous amount of, of output. Um, I can tell you like how I kind of started. I had been doing on camera and it wasn't even so much that I wanted to take on a different career. I just wanted to like broaden what I was currently doing because I feel like the two careers um, are actually closer related than people sometimes think. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had to develop a different skill set. So I started reading out loud books, poems, candy wrappers, magazines, whatever I could read out just to get it's a different technique. Um, and then I started doing, um, I took a lot of classes, commercial classes uh, to just get my commercial read sort of together. Then you have to learn the engineering side of it because you have to sort of be able to engineer your own stuff at home. So mm -hmm. learning some of the technical aspects of it, learning how to run even at least a simple program like Twisted Wave, some knowledge of microphones, you know, what you want to speak on, um, setting up a booth in your home. So you're sort of forced to, to become an engineer as well as a performer, which is a unique thing about uh, being a voice actor mm -hmm. um, and then acting for games is very, very, very much all of my training as an actor on camera completely applied. And so I had been doing that for a long time anyway, but even now, I mean, if I, if I can, if I have the time, I'll get in a class, I'll learn a new technique. I'll take an Alexander course. I'll, you know, read a new book. Uh, it, it's like, you have to be thirsty for knowledge. Like you have to be, um, it is, it is your greatest tool as an artist, um, which is like the, you know, the ability or the desire to learn. Yeah. And then the best piece of advice, if you want to be a voice actor or you want to be an actor in general, start, yeah. start, like start and then don't stop. If you really love it, don't. It's, it's, um, I, I you and I, we're on a very similar wavelength because you know, I, I get the question of how do I become a YouTuber? How do I become a podcaster? How do I get to do this? How do I get to do that? And I'm like, just start You're like, oh, I want to make sure I get everything perfect. And then I'll go jump into it. No, I'm like, it it's, it's that's never, the pitfall. 
<laughs> that's the pitfall. And we all still fall into it, right? Like I'll yeah. sometimes not do something because I'm like, I'm a, and that's a huge pitfall for me personally, which is like, I want it to be perfect, but perfection, it, it's a farce and it's only you. And it's really just you hamstringing yourself. Like, um, I'm sh I would imagine when you first started, like you probably didn't know shit. Right, like you probably didn't know anything. It's like I don't know where you didn't. You you definitely weren't as proficient as you were now. You didn't have half the knowledge you have. Like, and, and, but you had to just like I'm just gonna go. It's like it's the same kind of notion like when you're trying to teach a kid to swim, right? It's like I can tell you practically. Well, your arms do this, and you've got to like mm -hmm. in the water will feel this way, and then you've got to kick, and you've got to be sure to hold your breath. And breathe. but at the end of the day, it's like you, you got to push your ass in the water and go. Yeah. So like if you want if you want to be a voice actor, you want to podcast or live stream, or start. Yes. And just know ahead of time, you're going to fail. Like mm -hmm. I, I don't book more jobs than I book every week, every week by a large majority. And so does every other actor, you know, for every, like for every project you see your favorite actor on or favorite voice actor do, there were a hundred he, he or she didn't get. Yeah. Maybe. Get comfortable, failing. get really comfortable failing. And, and the other thing to add on to what you're saying is, don't look at failure as a negative thing. Look at it as positive reinforcement to get back on the horse and, and go at it again. Go better. Yeah. Do better. <laughs> there's a mis there's a misconception too. Like I totally agree with you on failure, and there's also a misconception with like actors, is like between like uh, between like working mm -hmm. and then like having a job. So you can always be working as an actor, yeah. right? In a class, reading a book shooting a little scene. I mean, now it's like, and it's daunting, but now it's like with, with phones as good as they are and simple setups, you can shoot some shit at your house. you right. Being employed as an actor is a different, is a different thing, but mm -hmm. you can always be working on your craft. You can always be like, you know, working on stuff. If you want to start voice acting, start your own, I don't know, start a YouTube channel where you do impersonations of your favorite characters or whatever. Like you can start anywhere. Mm -hmm. You won't care too much what other people think about it. So and like my, learn the subtle art of not giving a shit. <laughs> that is, is an essential skill. It really is. And and anyone who's watching now, if you're listening, if there's honestly, if there's anything you want to get into or try, think of it now. You have more of a chance of being able to do whatever you want to do now than say you ever. want to get into voice acting. Yeah. Like ever. And like, 10, Ever. 20 years ago, there was no roadmap. Now you've got Google, you've got YouTube, you got the internet. Like you literally, the only thing holding a lot of people back is themselves, their own fears. 100%. 100%. So winding down to the last few community questions, and then I'll go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll start the wrap up for this show. Again, being <laughs> respectful of your time. Um, Huey L wanted to ask a question. Did the pandemic have a big effect on your voice acting work? Interesting. Um, it definitely, so I'm, I was fortunate enough, um, just, so I, I do a lot of work from home. I have a studio set up in my house so that I can work. Um, mm -hmm. so some ways, in some ways, some of my work didn't change very much, um, mm -hmm. uh, in other ways, it changed drastically. Um, you know, any any production which required me to physically be in a space, which was is most games, um, which is even just some uh, some other work, like whether it's like you know for animation or, or commercial or whatever. Like uh, I was, I'm not able to do. The industry has also had to pivot a lot, so we've had to get better at uh, connecting studios to talent um, and figuring out how to make working from home possible. But um, I feel very fortunate to, to have a setup in my house that enables me to do some work. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, everything changed, everything shifted in one way or another, even if it was just a pivot, right. As opposed to like a total shutdown or, or like the disappearance of work, but yeah, opportunities were less and there is less work. Um, but you know, we'll, we're doing okay. We'll get through. Okay. We'll all go back. And then we've got uh, a question from uh, Gaming Master O. He wants to know what takes more of a toll on you, the physical acting or the voice acting? Hmm. Um, you know, it really isn't. So sometimes if something is like hyper physical, like a fight sequence or something like that, those can be physically demanding, but I really enjoy that physical part and I never feel. 
So I, th I think it, I think you let me answer it in two parts. If it's if it's physically demanding, just physically, like mm -hmm. out, um, you know, fight scenes, things that require a lot of choreography or a lot of like sort of mental engagement. Um, but really, what becomes the most draining, which has nothing to do with that, and it doesn't have anything to do with whether it's voice or body, is um, the emotional output of it. So if some if a scene is like highly emotionally, you know. Uh, has a high emotional demand, that's usually way more exhausting than, than anything else you're doing. Um, I remember some scenes, you know, from in The Walking Dead, there was like one particular day, which was just like a heavier day. And that day was way more exhausting and a shorter session than some of the like much longer sessions we had run. So it just kind of depends on what the, what, what content you're working on at the time. Okay. But emotional stuff is usually more. All right. We got a question from All Spark Warrior. He wants to know, uh, Jeff, and I, I know you can't talk too much on this because of NDAs. And for the yeah. audience, uh, non-disclosure agreements, uh, you know, there are many that Jeff and myself are bound to, and we cannot divulge information for various projects we may or may not be working on. So just so you guys understand that before we go forward. But Allspark uh, Warrior want to know, uh, where did your inspiration come from for your portrayal of Captain America and Steve Rogers. Mm. If we can't tread there, that's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll say like, you know, I'll just say some of it was, 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 was pulling into like, was honing in on some of the characteristics about him uh, as a character from like, from the lore that I found to be like the sort of most important and dialing into those. And then also like staying true to, um, the, the, his his roots and mm. like and, and for me it was important in a small way to keep that sort of um, that East Coast in him. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that's good for now. Okay, but I'm fine with it. I I understand, brother. <laughs> I understand. You gotta tread light, man. Super light. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> Every time someone asks me a Marvel question, I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> dude. Okay, so perfect example of that. Like, um, say, uh, so when Res well, when when uh, Final Fantasy VII remake, because I know you did some some work mm -hmm. in that as well. Yep. Um, when that was coming out and all the reviews were dropping, Square gave a specific. When I say specific, I'm talking about 14 pages yeah. of. You don't say this, 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 this. You don't cover that. You don't say this. Or that. And this. All of, yeah. right, it's like the all of us who got codes for it were like, okay, we're we got to tread lightly. And then you had yeah. one YouTuber who decided, screw Square, I'm gonna go ahead and put all the spoilers out and bash it. And the problem with that, I, I'm sure he's having a field day with the legal team there. But at the same time, it's like. I'm looking at stuff like that, why NDAs are so important because they affect so much. Yeah, know, I think what people realize about it is like, you know, I, I understand. Well, I mean, I guess that's not true. I really don't. I don't understand the notion of like spoiling stuff or, or you know, leaking things or hacking things. I really don't. It's yeah. just not. I like to be surprised. I like to not know. I don't want. So I don't understand the notion of like, you know, but. The other piece of that that I, that maybe the individuals that participate in that don't quite understand is like there's a tremendously large group of people that have put a lot of time, a lot of energy away from their families into creating these things and, and they become very personal. And um, you sort of you, 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 you tarnish and cheapen all that effort. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't I don't know. I'm not a fan of that. I'm not either. <laughs> I'm not either. It was unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so winding down to, okay, we got all the community questions. So I had a question for you. And Please. I think this is probably, is it? Yeah, I think it's my last question I have for you. Um, so 
of all the work you've done over the years, have you ever had the opportunity of working with other voice actors, you know, such as our mutual friend, Nick Apostolides or Ruben Langdon, or David Hayter or Michael Coleman or Griffin Burns or anyone like, have right. you ever had that opportunity? Like one-to-one, -one, like you're doing like a round table, uh, recording or, you know, d just asking. I'm not sure if my question makes sense. But. Like, so let me, well, let me, well, let me, let me just make sure. Like, um, you mean like, do we work in groups or yeah, like, like people, have, people that I've admired? Yeah. Like, have you worked with people you admired or have you ever had to like, when you're recording, like, I know when you're doing like the performance capturing and the motion capturing, a lot of times it's you and the person you're doing the scene with, you're working right. together. But like when you're recording, you know, like your lines. Oh. Yeah. In the booth. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So obviously, like, all your mocap stuff is done just like you would any other, any other, you know, on camera medium. So everyone's together um, in the booth. You, a lot of times you're by yourself. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you're lucky enough to get to do an ensemble read. Um, and I have gotten that experience. And I can tell you, like, it's a it's a great experience. And it's so much. More. I mean, look, as an actor, you want to play with other people. You know what I mean? It's not it's not as it's not as rich when you're alone mm -hmm. um, or it just or it just. It creates more of a challenge. You have to create more, you know what I mean? As opposed to having other people contribute, um, you know, getting to do some of the work um, on Avengers, we got to do um, things together. Um, and then uh, on The Walking Dead, we got to do it um, a couple times via, like uh, we Skyped into each other from two different studios. Um, anytime I get a chance to do that, that's the best. I love being in the booth with other actors. It's so much fun. We got actually two. Okay, guys, I'll take these last two questions because we're gonna res be respectful of Jeff's time. So, the last uh, last two questions. Uh, one is from Devil Hunter Nero. He okay. says, uh, "Are there any voice actors that you would like to work with, and why?" Um, yeah, I mean, I'm lucky to have gotten to work with some already that I, I really respected. I mean, there's a long list of people that I'd like to work with. Um, I'd love to get a chance to work with. Um, there's some animation guys that I, I'm really big fans of. I mean, I'd love to get a chance to work with uh, Bob Bergen um, or Charlie Adler. These are two guys who have, you know are just icons in, in animation and games. Um, and there's so much talent in the voice world and so many people that I'd like to, to, to be able to work with, mostly because, I mean, like I said before, you, you know, you want to be a student. Yeah. Always in everything you do, you know, you mean, you just always want to be learning and, and be open to learning something new. And, and, you know, if you can kind of check ego, then you yeah. really become open to, to, you know, all the experience or just different ways of working. I'm always excited to see a, the way a, another actor works fascinated by their process. You know what I mean? Even if at the end, right. My own, my, my judgment of it might be like, mm, I don't, that performance isn't really for me. I don't really, that's not for me, but God, I'm fascinated by the way they work. I mean, it's so interesting how they broke that down. It's like, so, you know, I'd like to work with fucking everybody if I could, because there's always something to learn. Always. Yeah. And then Ultra Gamer, he wants you to, he wants you to say this line. Oh <laughs> um, I just put it on the screen. So the, as Carlos said, the don't worry guys, I'm not going to leave you fans in a cold, cruel Carlos in this world. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. I'm not gonna go ahead and leave you in a cold, cruel Carlos's world. That'd be too cool. Awesome. Um. So, um, dude, my question: When are we gonna see you in Hawaii when this pandemic clears? Hopefully soon, man. I'd love to come. I would love to. And if I'm there, to be like, better believe I'm hitting you up, dude. If you need a place to stay, like literally, everyone in the industry they come here. I'm like, stay here, and they stay with me. So we got a five bedroom house. And we have a room, so if y'all ever need. Right on, brother. I love it. We'll be there. And uh, I, I lied. I have a final question for you before we go. Sure. Did you have fun? Hell yeah. A <laughs> good, I'm really happy to be here. I, I truly, truly, thanks for having me. It's a fun conversation. You got you run a really good you really run a really good ship here. It's like nice and chill and relaxed and very welcoming. Thanks to everybody else for, for who, who tuned in and was asking questions and stuff. I really appreciate you guys. And then, and I also just want to say like, I don't, and, and, and I appreciate you being here and being so cool, especially considering like what, you know, what's going on and what happened with your kid. And so 
thanks, man. My, my heart goes out to you as an animal lover. I get it. Yeah. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. And, Good. Um, Happy to spend <laughs> and, uh, uh, Again, people, you can catch Jeff on uh, he, he's all his social media links and are in the description below this podcast. Both the video version and the audio version will be going up later. Uh, he's going. He's if you haven't already, you're watching this and you haven't picked up Capcom's Resident Evil Three remake, which he's one of the main stars in. I don't know what you're doing with your life. Go pick up Resident Evil Three remake. And also, uh, if you want to pre-order, uh, you should definitely go and pre-order. Marvel's Avengers that's coming out that he is playing Captain America, a.k.a. Steve Rogers in. Phenomenal. I've gotten to see a whole lot of it. I can't speak further on it due to NDA. I can't. I can't say anything. But it's amazing. Um, I'm not paid to say that. It was really <laughs> clear. <laughs> but definitely go and check it out, guys. And uh, uh, Jeff, is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we go? No, just a big thank you, guys. I really appreciate everyone being here and hanging out. And, and thanks for all your support. It means a lot. It really does. And thank you to you, man. Cool. And uh, you guys can catch this episode of the podcast along with many others on all major podcasting outlets from Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Pandora. You can also support the podcast on Patreon and with channel memberships. Gets you early and exclusive access to content for as little as a dollar a month. It's if you can, you don't have to. I also have a discord. You guys can hop in and uh, we communicate there and I let you guys know. And with that being said, um, this is Jeff and I, we're signing out. We hope y'all have a great one. Cheers guys. Hey, did you enjoy this episode of the cast of a podcast? Well, I'm sure you did. And since you did, and you're wondering where else you can find it, you can find it on every podcasting outlet. Yes, it includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Launchpad DM by Podcast One, and so much more. And the only thing I ask of you is if you truly enjoyed it, even if you didn't enjoy it, please leave a rating and tell us what you thought of it, what you like, what you didn't like, and everything in between. And also, if you're looking for video formats of this podcast and many more, you'll be able to find them on youtube.com slash Mikel Casanova, as well as on twitch.tv slash Mikel Casanova, and new episodes every single Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, with that being said, this is Mikel Casanova, Hawaii's favorite YouTuber. I am signing out. You guys have a great one.